I'm Andrew Schwartz, and you're listening to The Truth of the Matter, a podcast by CSIS where we break down the top policy issues of the day and talk with the people that can help us best understand what's really going on. To get to the truth of the matter about the announcement that India has overtaken China as the world's largest country, and to talk about population in general, we have with us demographer and CSIS senior associate Jennifer Shuba. Jen, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Andrew. Thank you for having me on here to talk about this exciting and important issue. Well, before we get to China and India, I want to ask you, how should we be thinking about population now? It's different than we used to think about it, isn't it? It is different. And it's so important to think about. I'm, I'm really fortunate that one of the things that I've gotten to do with CSIS over the last few years is work with the executive education program for people who are thinking about foresight and trying to understand how we can prepare ourselves for challenges and opportunities of the future. And I think it's fitting that in that, demographics goes first. And that's because people are really the foundation of every society. We are the people who show up on the streets to demonstrate or show up at the polls to vote. And we're the people who consume and produce and, you know, sometimes we're the people who pick up guns and, and charge into battle. So you really can't understand where you are today or where you've come from or where you're going unless you get first this baseline understanding of demographics. And as you said, where we are today is different. And I think it's a really remarkable time for people who have not thought much about demographics to enter into this conversation And that's because we've just hit 8 billion people. So that was in November. And when we've hit these other population milestones and we were kind of zoom out and look at these big billions, I think you can make the argument, which I do, that the world had a lot of similarities. But when we've hit this 8 billion, and I talk about this in my most recent book, which is called 8 Billion and Counting, When we hit this 8 billion, we're really far apart. We have this global demographic divide. Like if you think about last century, we started that century with 1.6 billion and ended with 6.1 billion. It was just this huge century of growth. And by the time we're at this eight, we see a pulling apart of countries that still have high fertility and fast growth and those that don't but we're really headed towards the same place by the time we get to our 9 billion, which is that the world is going to become smaller. And so we have to understand that there has been a fundamental shift in global population trends, that decades of low fertility are leading us around the world to the the point now that we have over 30 countries that are shrinking, the population aging widespread in places that we would have never thought about facing population aging, and that includes India. So speaking of India, on April 24th, the UN officially announced that India has overtaken China to be the world's most populous country. What are the key factors that contributed to this demographic shift? Well, the three ingredients of any population change are fertility, mortality, and migration. That's it. So I like to think of them as dials that turn up or down in different directions to to produce different outcomes nationally. And for India to take the top spot, we need to look not only at India's demographics, but also those of China, which had had the top spot. And there are two demographic giants. I mean, together, they're almost 3 billion of our 8 billion people. So they, they take up a lot of the space there. In China's case, fertility dial had been turned down for a while, as a lot of people know. And they also had deaths under control. We had that mortality dial turned down as well. And migration, we would say, was fairly neutral. I would say that to be the case for both places. In India, same thing, but it kind of happened after and to not as a rapid of a degree. So what happens is, of course, over time when you have more deaths than births and immigration is neutral, then your population shrinks. And that's where China just got to. Whereas in India, fertility has fallen, but it is, I don't want to use the word behind because that, that implies that there's there's some ultimate destination to be there. But I'll say at a pace that was behind that of, of China's decline. So a lot of times we talk about population or overpopulation as being a problem 
Sometimes we talk about underpopulation as being a problem. Where is India on this? That's a great question. And it's funny because I give a lot of talks about population and I can, if I had two in a day, I could walk into a room where everyone's convinced before I got there that the world is overpopulated and India would be an exemplary place to, where that has taken place. And then I could go into the next one and they'd say, there's not enough people. So I think India really is a almost like a microcosm of the globe itself. Its population is still growing. So India actually adds about a million people a month, which is astonishing how many people that is. But the growth rate has been falling for decades and decades because fertility has been falling. And so India, like most places on the globe, now has what we call below replacement fertility. That is generally a number below two-ish. There's a little margin of error built in there to account for those people born who don't make it to puberty. In India's case, that margin is 0.19. So India's replacement level, according to the UN, is 2.19. You'll see it below 2.1 in some places that have really low infant and child mortality rates. So that right there tells you something about India, actually. But India, is their population is still growing because of past momentum. So we, we call this uh, baked in from the past. So family planning efforts in India, they do keep fertility low, but the growth that they're experiencing now doesn't really change based on that because they're already overall at below replacement fertility level. So the cohorts of potential mothers are large from the past when fertility was higher. And that's why India is still growing. So if we want to use the phrase overpopulation in India, I think we have to be really careful about that. We always should have been. But in this case, when it, they've already got below replacement fertility. So hopefully we're not talking about a situation where people say, oh, let's deal with the people who are already born, right? We don't want to get into some coercive ethical issues here. That growth is going to keep happening no matter what. And, and that's important for us to know. When we also talk about overpopulation, it's good to think about how people relate to the environment around them. And in India's case, we do know that there are still issues with making sure we have clean water and adequate food. And so I think we can find other phrases than overpopulation because that one is laden with all kinds of garbage from the past. But we don't want to take away the fact that there are a lot of people there whose basic needs aren't being met. Well, how does this announcement impact India's role on the global stage? Does it, it impact it a lot? What, you know, what are we talking I, that's about? That's a really good question, and, and that's one that I would even love to, to hear your thoughts on or other folks at CSIS, because I think from a population standpoint, it presents India with a moment. And what they do with that moment is up to them. A lot of the time... In my career, I have noticed that people don't really care what the population numbers actually are. It's the perception that matters more. And I think in the case of who's the most populous country in the world, that perception comes into play. So with China having the world's largest population, I think a lot of the way other countries viewed China was caught up in the fact that they were so big. I mean, even the U.S. gets to ride the coattails of being the third most populous country in the world. So for India, as the country that had been number one, China, depopulates, perception of China starts to shift. And I know that you've seen that and, and listeners will have, have maybe even felt that themselves. Oh, they're depopulating. That must mean that they're going to lose power or are already losing power and influence. That's perception, has nothing to do with numbers. So in India's case, does that perception follow that perhaps they're on the rise? And I think there's a lot to be said for just this reputation and feeling. Now, what we can talk about is whether or not they really capitalize on this moment. Right. So, you know, I think a lot of my colleagues would say it depends upon what you mentioned earlier. Are their needs being met? Are people being educated in the right ways? Are they being educated enough? And I think, you know, in the United States, we look at our population as our greatest strength. We have people power here. We have innovation. Is that going to translate in India? 
that's where the worry really should be taking over for India's leaders today. And I think it is informally having talked to several over the last six months, particularly around this 8 billion number. I think there's a sense that India is poised to really translate its population strength into global strength. And there's a willingness among some of the elite for that. But there's also a frustration that they're not moving fast enough. And so, yes, India has some significant issues with seizing its window of opportunity. So there's a particular phenomenon we talk about with population that as a country goes through this demographic transition from lots of births and deaths to fewer births and deaths, they get to a point in the age structure of the population where there are fewer child dependents. And I just published a commentary for CSIS where we have these three population pyramid graphs that people can go to and hit play and watch how the age structure of the country shifts over time. And that illustrates this window of opportunity when the bulk of population is a prime working ages and the country could potentially reap what's called a demographic dividend, which is accelerated economic growth if you've made investments. Because you and I know from our retirement portfolios, we're not getting a dividend unless we've actually invested something. And so I think there is a real danger that India squanders this opportunity because we know that the... Education rates are still so low. I recently was reading back through these very long, they're like 180 pages, demographic and health surveys of India that that came out covering through 2021. And female literacy is just really still very low. And it's, it's not moving as fast as it should. When I think about having studied India the last 20 years, you kind of hope you go back into the data after a couple of years and you see something new and surprising. We don't necessarily see that. In the state of Bihar, which, by the way, has the highest fertility in India, but only three children per woman on average, which is not that high, only 55% of women are literate. That's really low. And actually, 76% of men in that state are literate as well. That is not great. They're not building this human capital foundation that East Asian economies had done when their demographics were at a similar point that really allowed them to have that accelerated growth and and pop to the top of the global order there. Nearly half of women over age 40 can't read. So there is an age issue here as well. Who, and I think why this is important is, and this is what I love about demographics, the people of the future are already born. So if we already know that half of women over age 40 can't read, And I'm thinking about these women when they're 70 years old. If this was my mother, I'd be really concerned about that because your your vulnerability to poverty in old age is much higher, of course, if if you're illiterate. And it's not good for the children either. 67% of children between six months old and just under five years old are stunted, which means they're chronically undernourished. And that also affects them throughout their life course. So... The investments have to be made today in order to reap the benefits in the future. Yeah, I mean, clearly what you're saying is that if India doesn't respond to these challenges, their population won't work to their advantage at all. That's right. And it's happening really quickly as well. So we look at, at Western Europe when they went through a similar demographic transition from high births and deaths to low. It took them like 70 years for the population ages 60 plus to go from 15% of the total to 30%. India is going to make that same transition in 34 years, I would say, or less. So they've got half the time to reap this, this demographic dividend with the bulk of population in prime working ages. So it's not like they can just take their time and hope this happens. These investments, they have to be really strong now. They really have to change something now to have a workforce that is building capital to provide that base for the economy and provide that base for financial security at the household level as well. Women's labor force participation is still really low. 2021, I think it was about 23% of women in the workforce. And we see this actually across education groups, rural, urban, you know, slice it all the ways, it is still really low. Little asterisk on it that there may be some data issues with the way they count if you do domestic work, like in the home and outside the home, they kind of 
privilege that domestic work at home. Like I might not count as in the workforce because I do a lot of stuff at home. <laughs> uh, but, but the general consensus among Indian economists is, yeah, it's still really low. So let's look at the differences between India and China and how their demographics compare. What are some of the key similarities and differences as you see them? Well, one of the similarities and we don't necessarily know if this translates into military power, economic power, et cetera, but it's notable, we can't forget it, is that both of them have skewed sex ratios at birth. And I know that China, most people know this about China, and they they would say, well, when the one-child policy came into place, because you had the strong son preference in society, then we saw rates of female infanticide and then sex-selective abortion come into play, and we know that there are millions and millions of missing females in China. Well, the same thing has happened in India as well. In the 1970s, prenatal testing to determine the sex of a child was introduced, and we saw skewed sex ratios there as well. It has been normalizing there. Normal is considered about 104 males per 100 females, and now it's about 108. So it's it's getting closer to normal, whereas in China, it's still 111. But it is still the case. And you can see that as well from those population pyramids. If you go back into that commentary I wrote and you're looking for this now, you can see on the side, because women are on the right and men are on the left, the millions of missing females there as well. The reason I mention this is that it reflects gender norms. And gender norms are very important The fact that women are less literate, the fact that women, uh, we still have high maternal mortality rates, women participate less in the workforce. Sex ratio at birth being skewed reflects the same kind of gender norms that are, are keeping women out of the workforce, illiterate, and in poor health. And when we talk about a country reaping a demographic dividend, if you've got half of the population excluded, then you're not making the most of your population at all. And it doesn't really matter how many people you have if you're leaving such a huge chunk behind. China and India have a lot of dissimilarities as well. China is far more urbanized today than India is. According to India's government, they might hit 38% urbanized by the middle of next decade, but China's already 65%. And we know that urbanization and economic growth, those things swim together. So we also have seen literacy rates being much higher in China, female labor force participation as well. So there's some really key differences there that mean India is not necessarily the next China. What do you see as the major challenges that China and India face going forward with their populations? I think that both need to recognize that they're on the same path towards aging and shrinking countries eventually. Now, China is already there. And by the way, 40 years ago, you can read through Chinese government documents, they knew that they were headed towards population aging. This was not a surprise. Again, demography, you can see the future. But understanding that you have to set up structures and institutions now to deal with your future population is just important for everyone. China needs to continue to address the needs of its growing elderly population. But if I'm the government, I'll be honest with you, I wouldn't want to make a ton of promises because the writing is on the wall. And I see what happens in Western Europe when you have these huge social welfare states. It's almost like uh, you're a zero-sum game that either individuals and families are going to really face the strains, or the government's going to face the strains. And I think that's where actually a lot of Western analysts make a mistake when they look at China's aging population and they say, oh, the government's going to go broke. Well, actually, they're not going to go broke because they haven't promised to take care of this population. It's the families and individuals that will suffer. So they need to work on striking a balance to meet the needs of the people, but also watch those government budgets. India has a while before the population will start shrinking. We're looking at, you know, well after mid-century. But that will be here before they know it. I I mean, I know my own lifetime has gone by very fast. (laughs) And so you know that you can put in place systems now that could 
help alleviate old age poverty, but also make the most of the population you have and really investing in human capital, that is a benefit you reap even when you have an older population. And Japan is one example of that. Japan, they reap what we kind of call a silver dividend. So it's like second demographic dividend that when you have this accumulation of capital in the household that is invested, that is used, and that contributes to the overall economy being strong. In India, unless households are able to pull themselves out of poverty, then you won't reap your first dividend and you definitely won't reap your second one. Let's turn now to Africa. The UN predicts that by 2050, Africa will be home to over 25% of the world population. What's driving that growth? So I mentioned at the top that we have this demographic divide globally. 71% of our countries. Two out of three people on the planet live somewhere with below replacement fertility. That is now the norm. And that norm has shifted in the last 20 years. So most of the world is, if not already sh- not, not already shrinking, there's only 30 countries that are shrinking now. They're headed that way. And so who's not? That's really the countries in sub-Saharan Africa. Half of global growth between now and mid-century comes from sub-Saharan Africa, because this is the place in the world where most of the countries with above replacement fertility are concentrated. And in fact, within sub-Saharan Africa, 40% of their growth comes from just four countries. And that's uh, Democratic Republic of the Congo, Ethiopia, Nigeria, and Tanzania. So of the very few countries that still have really high fertility, most of them are in sub-Saharan Africa. And that means that Africans become a greater proportion of the world's population. Jen, where is your research now taking you? What, what's the next thing that you're really looking at? I really want to help lead conversations in thinking about what population aging looks like outside of Western Europe and Japan. Because it happened, that demographic transition happened so quickly that when I wrote my dissertation, 20 years ago, when I was started working on population aging, the three oldest countries in the world, Germany, Italy, and Japan, their median age was 40. Now you're looking at Thailand and Cuba and Kuwait having similar median ages that I blinked my eyes and it happened. And the settings are really different now. A quarter of our aged countries are not democracies. So what does it look like to have population aging in a non-democracy? Are we at risk for greater coercion in terms of births? Are we at risk for more isolationist policies? Does global cooperation become more difficult? Do you see countries with an unwillingness and inability to fund causes like humanitarian assistance? Uh, Or do you see people saying, hey, let's go to Africa and put a lot of investment in Africa set up shop there, take advantage of a large youth population that can work. I mean, right now, I think we're a little on the former rather than the latter, but we need to have a lot of conversations about what that looks like. And I think we also need to have some very, very, very tough conversations about what it looks like to not be obsessed with economic growth and expansion. Because when populations are contracting, it's a, lot, it's a lot more difficult, and none of our incentive structures, whether you're the, the CEO of a corporation or the leader of a country, you're never rewarded for degrowth, <laughs> but if that becomes a reality, then we need to have had, had some thoughts about even putting that in context of environmental change. I mean, We've had a lot of environmentalists for decades say, oh, can we continue to expand at this pace? But everybody ignored them because they're like, oh, we just value economic growth. But when the population changes as well, maybe that gives a little more credence to the idea that we need to think about, could we do that gracefully rather than see it as a collapse? Jen, thank you so much for helping us make sense of all this. And I know we'll look forward to having you back on the podcast soon. Thank you, Andrew. I appreciate it. If you enjoyed this podcast, check out our larger suite of CSIS podcasts from Into Africa, The Asia Chessboard, China Power, AIDS 2020, The Trade Guys, Smart Women, Smart Power, and more. You can listen to them all on major streaming platforms like iTunes and Spotify.
Visit csis.org slash podcasts to see our full catalog. 